morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on what you need to know about setting up funds in Luxembourg. I'm going to pass you to my colleague, Connie Wong, in our Hong Kong office. Thank you, Connie. Thanks, Eddie. Hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, what you need to know about setting up funds in Luxembourg. My name is Connie Wong, and I'm the executive director of Waystone. Waystone is a leading provider of institutional governance, risk and compliance services to the asset management industry. We're now supporting asset managers with more than a trillion US dollars in AUM. We're very delighted to have two subject matter experts speaking with us this afternoon. My colleague, Valentin from our Luxembourg office and Stefan from Arant. Arant is the leading law firm in the Luxembourg market. They are advising more than 4,800 funds and sub funds worth more than US uh, 1.6 trillion US dollars. Around is advising 63% of the 30 largest promoters who have funds domiciled in Luxembourg. Stefan is a partner of Around and the head of the Hong Kong office. He has been advising clients based in Asia Pacific region regarding their European projects and their Luxembourg legal and regulatory questions, including the structuring, setting up, and marketing of the funds under USIT and AIFMD. Valentin is the Associate Director at Waystone based in Luxembourg. She has extensive knowledge in investment vehicle structuring, cross-border distribution, delegate oversight, and client solutions management. Valentin is an active member of Luxembourg Private Equity and Venture Capital Association, where she helps the association in respect of all the marketing and promotion activities to improve the attractiveness of Luxembourg for both regulated and unregulated private equity and venture capital funds. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please put them into the question box in your control panel. We will have time for Q&A at the end. Now, without further ado, today's agenda, we will be talking about Luxembourg as a fund domicile, the available fund regimes, factors to consider when setting up a fund, and of course, where can the fund be distributed? This should give managers an overview of the Luxembourg market. And to highlight here, we will be hosting um, another two to three series where we will dive into the details in APES and use it respectively. Stefan and Valentin, you're both the advocate of Luxembourg. So tell us why choosing Luxembourg as a fund domicile. Well, thank you very much, Connie, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Alison, and the whole uh, Waystone team for giving us the opportunity to 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 partner on this. Uh, maybe if we go on the next slide, we'll we'll see a few facts on on Luxembourg, which are always good to recap. So, uh, the only Grand Duchy in the world, uh, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, is a landlocked country between Germany, France, and Belgium. Uh, we have about 600,000 uh, people, 630,000 people uh, residing in Luxembourg, 47% being foreigners. What, what we like to, to highlight, besides the fact we are a prime financial center in Europe, as we will see uh, soon, is a very sound and balanced uh, public finance. As you can see, 28% sovereign debt, uh, a, a very small deficit. Uh, it's probably going to be a little bit uh, worse as we will uh, uh, go through the pandemic crisis, but still we uh, have a AAA rating, which we've always had, never lost it, even at the worst of the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008. And we have one of the highest GDP per capita, pretty good uh, uh, employment rate, uh, a very decent growth rate as well, um, very much linked to the financial center. Next slide, please. If you look at uh, Luxembourg, uh, it's a prime financial center within the EU. And if we look specifically uh, on the fund business, uh, it's a very, very large uh, portion of our activities over there and also for activity as a firm and as service provider. So we're the largest cross-border fund center in the world. Um, the US is largest, but it's pretty much a domestic market, whereas Luxembourg is primarily cross-border distribution driven. Uh, we have about uh, 3,500 plus uh, investment funds based in Luxembourg, 15,000 fund units, meaning share class, sub funds, et cetera, representing of over 5 trillion euro 
of assets under management, which is quite significant. Um, as you can see in the uh, lower part on the left side of the slide, a very broad diversity of sponsors are using Luxembourg in order to create their funds. We have the US, the UK, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, uh, you know, France, Belgium, etc. And we do have also quite a number of, of Asian players, uh, whereas from China, from uh, uh, Japan, from Korea, uh, from Hong Kong, Singapore, Southeast Asia, etc. So from pretty much every country in the region, we do have sponsor using Luxembourg. Um, one big particularity of Luxembourg uh, on which I would like to, to uh, insist is the cross-border element. As you see on the low right corner of this slide, 67% of funds that are distributed in over two jurisdictions, in addition to their home country, are Luxembourg incorporated or Luxembourg established. So we're talking here primarily about USITS funds, but as you can see, when you compare to other jurisdictions, Luxembourg really stands out. And so Luxembourg very much is uh, uh, well known for many years, over 30 years, for its USITS product. And we'll see in detail what, what USITS is about in this first series of, of, of webinars dedicated to, to funds made in Luxembourg. But what we should also be aware is that Luxembourg from uh, the early 2000s to now has been uh, tremendously growing with regards to alternative investment funds. Um, for vehicles, uh, we have introduced in the Luxembourg toolbox non-regulated and regulated alternative investment fund vehicles and also driven by the alternative investment fund managers directive AIFMD which we're going to talk about in more detail uh, which has been introduced in the EU in 2011 then implemented in uh, various member states so just a snapshot of two two slides on on the the, the fundamentals of Luxembourg and uh, we have another slide if we could go on it for which I think Valentin you, you wanted to give a few more figures about Luxembourg thank you thank you Ali Connie and Stefan and a warm welcome to everybody sure certainly so um let's continue this introduction by having a look at the asset and the management in Luxembourg so as Stefan said, as we speak, we have approximately 5 trillion euro invested in UCITS and AIF products. This makes Luxembourg the largest investment fund center in Europe. And as we said, the second largest in the world. So we can say that Luxembourg funds have a dominant share in both the retail and the institutional marketplace in Europe. And they are also the vehicle of choice outside of Europe in many parts of Asia, Latam, and the Middle East. Needless to say that Luxembourg is well known for the uses industry, which has grown over the last 25 years. And Luxembourg was indeed the first country to implement the usage directive back in um, 85. But as you can see on this slide, out of the 5 trillion euro I mentioned, more than 4 trillion are invested through usage vehicle with more, as we speak, than 1,600 usage funds. So as we said, the attractiveness of the usage brand goes certainly beyond Europe, and Luxembourg is seeing more and more initiators launching funds, both to break into European markets and also to sell back in their domestic markets. Luxembourg, as Stefan mentioned, is also a major center for alternative assets, the quick implementation of the IFM directive, granting also an EU passport to alternative managers has certainly helped Luxembourg to further develop um, as a regulated hub for alternative product, building obviously on the success and experience in, in usage. And um, as we said, the introduction a few years ago, not only of the RIFE regime, but also of the SLP regime, have contributed to this success. As you can see, we count already more RIFE and, and SLP vehicles than usage, with more than a thousand RIFE vehicles already launched and more than a thousand SLP vehicles already launched. So um, it is also important here to mention um, that uh, the statistics that we have at end do not allow us to capture the total number of SLPs but only the ones with what we call an authorized AIFM. So number are much higher. 
authorized IFM, by the way, which count already for more than 260 established entities in Luxembourg with local substance and, and workforce. So um, these two vehicles are of particular appeal to initiators willing to expand their assets and limited partner base. Similar to um, the vehicles that we see um, in offshore centers, the RIFE and the SLP do not require the direct intervention from the Luxembourg regulator, also known as the CSSF, in order to be launched. And accordingly, there were definitely a great and a long awaited addition to what we call the Luxembourg toolbox. Okay, Valentin and also Stefan for, for a, a great introduction why uh, we, we should be considering uh, Luxembourg as the fund domicile. And I guess the next question uh, many managers, including myself, will ask is what are the available fund regimes in Luxembourg that we can consider? And, and I guess before we get into that, Valentin, do, do you want to share from your experience what needs to be considered first when deciding a structure? Yeah. So um, as I said, um, when describing all the structuration options available in Luxembourg, we often refer to um, what we know as the toolbox. So we have a long established tradition of innovation in our industry with a broad range of investment vehicle with different legal forms, regime, tax qualification and regulatory framework. So, I think it's fair to say that um, whatever you need or almost whatever you need, Luxembourg has it. Luxembourg is a very flexible jurisdiction for investment and firm structuring. And when it comes, as you said, Connie, to understanding market needs, I'd like always to refer to what I call the three I's. So as you see on the slide, the first one being the initiator view, the second one being the investor's view, and the third one being um, the investments. So to start is, um, what does the initiators, i.e. the sponsor of the project needs? Then what do the investors need? For example, in terms of protection, right, tax or legal framework and compressed in the vehicle. And last but not least, but how will the initiator accommodate the target investments? For example, in terms of asset type and maybe diversification requirement. So I would say that those are the three main questions to be answered when it comes to the most appropriate solution among the Luxembourg toolbox options. Um, if we can go to next slide to have a look at the toolbox. So as you can see on this slide, um, our toolbox offers tailored solution for fund managers and also for their investors allowing a combination of features from non-regulated option as the special purpose vehicle on the left-hand side of the slide to what we all know as being the highly regulated option, uh, the usage on the right-hand side of the slide. And in the middle of this, you can see that the right that we, that we mentioned, um, which is actually an indirectly regulated vehicle as it is regulated via its authorized IEFM. You may remember those 260s uh, established entity we, we highlighted in, in the beginning of the discussion. So um, Luxembourg Toolbox offers a large spectrum of legal, regulatory and, and structural choice. And um, we thought it would be a good idea to have um, today a few concrete scenarios, starting with the most regulated products, maybe the usage, if you can go to next slide, please. Great. So usage vehicle, as we speak, accounting for more than 4 trillion euro assets under management in Luxembourg, just as a recap, what are their main features and for what type of project may they be uh, the go-to solution? So a USITS fund is, first of all, a regulated vehicle under the direct approval and supervision of the regulator, the CSSF. 
A usage vehicle is also a vehicle that can be structured as an umbrella. This means that the umbrella, the fund, can accommodate different investment strategies, each of those being in one segregated sub-fund. A usage vehicle benefits from the European passports, and accordingly, it's a vehicle which shares or units can be promoted to all type of investors in the EU, speaking from retail to institutional investors. Um, it is a vehicle that has to reach within uh, the first six months, a minimum uh, amount of 1.25 million and um, a vehicle that has prior to launch to be approved by, by the CSSF, as we said. Um, something important, it is a vehicle that can accommodate liquid strategies and that has to provide to its um, investors liquidity at least twice a month. But true to say that it's also a vehicle that has strict investment restriction with diversification rules and risk trading requirement that has to be taken in consideration. So this is why usage vehicle as perceived as a safe and well-regulated investment and are very popular among many investors looking to invest across Europe. Okay. What we can, just maybe what we can also say on this is that from what we see on the market, non-EU initiators um, select the option of a usage vehicle. If for example, they were to consider launching a parallel vehicle to their existing non-EU fund to gain access to EU investors by replicating their strategy. So accordingly, local managers can utilize their experience and expertise to participate to the portfolio management of a fund, which will be promoted to EU investors. And um, as Stefan reminded me uh, just before this webinar, it's true that UCITS are um, well known to be the vehicle of choice for liquid strategy and to accommodate retail investors. But we should bear in mind that still approx 70% of the cash invested in UCITS is invested by institutional investors, such as family offices, private banks, or insurance companies. And I'm now happy to to hand over to, to Stefan to go through uh, the AIF vehicles that we also have in the toolbox. Well, thank, thank you, Valentin. And, and looking, at, looking at the AIFs, and, and if you remember the uh, sort of uh, list of vehicles which we have, I mean, one of the purpose of this would be to, to shed some light on each of them, but we'll not go through uh, uh, so much detail for all of them. Um, the, the two vehicles I'm gonna talk about now um, are very relevant, but we'll spend more time on the RAFE and the SLP because to the Asian market, uh, certainly the RAFE and the uh, SLP are the more relevant. Just a word still on, on usage. We see quite a lot of them uh, being set up by sponsors uh, in Asia. Uh, indeed, liquid strategies, Chinese strategies, which we've done quite a lot uh, with, uh, with sponsors in the region as well. For a distribution in Europe, as well as South America, Middle East, and back to Asia. I must say that what I see quite, quite often is Asian sponsors having uh, a usage structure in order to sell on a pan-Asian basis, whether in Singapore, which is a prime market for uh, usage uh, distribution, as well as um, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, uh, in Korea, in Japan, and in many different uh, places. Usage are also quite um, uh, heavily invested by uh, QDII from China. So let's speak about the UCI in just, just a few words, if we can go backwards to the UCI slide just after the UCITS one. Thank you. So that's basically the domestic version of UCITS made in Luxembourg. So it's a domestic public fund in Luxembourg. The big advantage of that is that it's not bound by usage rules, so it can invest in a variety of assets, including real estate, including uh, a private equity venture capital, which a usage cannot do, as you understood from what Valentin mentioned. But it's still a public fund, and it's still uh, relevant for quite a number of uh, investors. We've seen QDII from China willing to invest into UCIs. Uh, and we've seen Japanese FCP UCI, so the, the contractual version of, of the UCI being set up in order to uh, be uh, invested by 
uh, a feeder fund made in uh, Japan. So basically, we see that quite often uh, in practice, and, and we have quite a number of them. In Asia, it's primarily the two aspects I mentioned uh, just now. Um, the second vehicle, next slide, is the C-Card. Just to mention it, it's investment company in risk capital. So for you to know, and it, you see it's quite, it's quite a, a popular vehicle as well with, uh, with uh, 55 billion in them and 225 C-Cars being set up as of end of February. For you to know that we have this vehicle, it's a totally specific regime for investment in risk capital. Uh, and so these are available to you in Luxembourg. Let's go to SIF, which is the next slide. That's the specialized investment fund. Um, I want to speak about the SIF together with the RAFE, which is the Reserved Alternative Investment Fund, because these are almost the same thing, except the SIF is regulated and the RAFE is indirectly regulated, as Valentin mentioned, but as a vehicle is not regulated. So SIF was the first attempt back in 2007 to introduce a vehicle that would be lightly regulated dedicated to professional investors, institutional investors, well-informed investors, with pretty light risk diversification rules, 30% diversification rules, and no restriction as to what you can invest in. So basically you can invest in a, in a great variety of assets. As you see, 1,415 SIFs later, uh, um, we have now about 600 uh, billion in those funds. It's a huge success, um, great success, since the introduction of the RAFE in 2016, we do a little bit less of them because, as I said, the only difference is that the CIF is regulated, RAFE is not. And if your investor is not requiring you to invest into a regulated fund, most managers now would do a RAFE as opposed to a CIF. RAFE, which is the next slide, is virtually the same thing, um, except it's not regulated as a vehicle. The only requirement it has by law is to appoint an alternative investment fund manager in the EU that has the full-fledged AIFMD license. That's the requirement. And, and it's not necessarily directly applicable to the specialized investment fund. A few more features uh, similar to SIFs um, is the umbrella feature that Valentin mentioned just before for USITS. So you can have a fund that has different sub fund within the same umbrella and implement totally different strategies or similar strategies or accommodate certain investors. Those sub funds can even invest into one another, which can uh, help you to have some sort of blended strategy for investors. And so it's a huge success, 1,134 RAFEs. Since the introduction in 2016, it's almost one new RAFE set up every business day. So that gives you an idea of the success of that. And if I look at it from, from an Asian point of view, uh, that was, uh, that was a, a game changer because when I've been based here 10 years, uh, when I've been discussing with typical Cayman fund managers in the region to set up a SIF back in 2009 when I was here, we only had the SIF really to, to offer them. The stretch was just too big for them to switch from a Cayman structure to a lightly regulated SIF structure. But since 2016, and for a variety of reasons we'll see later, um, uh, there's a huge um, interest for RAFEs that has started back in 2016, and we've had quite a lot of managers making the step, having Fund 1, 2, 3 in the Cayman, and Fund 4 is in, is in Luxembourg as a RAFE. And we've seen that from all the region, uh, China, Korea, uh, Japan, big success in Japan with institutional investors in Japan, also Hong Kong, Singapore, and the rest uh, of Asia, in particular Southeast Asia. If I now look at the last vehicle we wanted to talk about uh, on the next slide is the special limited partnership. This, um, as you understand, in 2007, we, we moved towards a, a sort of lightly regulated fund vehicle next to the UCITS and UCI. Um, in 2016, we've introduced the RAFE, which is as such not regulated. Still, something was missing a full-fledged limited partnership that is inspired by uh, uh, common law and Anglo-Saxon systems uh, was not available as such in Luxembourg. We had something similar, but it was still a corporate vehicle bound by a number of rules, and it was not exactly what investors were willing to see and what sponsor were willing to set up. We've introduced that in 2013 when we modified a company law in Luxembourg and we decided to include 
uh, in, a, in a very clever way, uh, a regime that is greatly inspired by Anglo-Saxon uh, rules, leaving a lot of freedom uh, to sponsors to you know, have a limited partnership agreement that would uh, cover uh, what they would typically cover in an LPA uh, of a Cayman structure of an Anglo-Saxon structure. Two differences or even three differences with, with RAFES that I would like to, to highlight to you, not no possible to have uh, subfunds or umbrella. Uh, these are standalone structures. You can have underneath different SPVs, we'll see that later, but still it's one given vehicle. Uh, no diversification requirements, so that's, that's rather an advantage compared to uh, compared to RAFE, so you can invest in one single asset, that's all okay, which is not the case for a RAFE. And third, you may appoint an AIFM, uh, so an Alternative Investment Fund Manager, whereas in the RAFE, you have to, right? It's not an option, it's a must. In the SLP, it's an option until you reach a certain threshold, which we are not going to mention here, um, but above 100 million or 500 million subject to certain conditions, then you have to appoint an AIFM. But if you uh, do not wish to, if you lower under those thresholds, you do not have to uh, in an SLP. So, so that's, uh, Connie, basically what I wanted to, to, to stress on those alternative investment vehicles which we have in Luxembourg. I think that's really helpful. I think that the way that you and also Valentin to put out there the type of funds available in Luxembourg and also, of course, a very comprehensive, I think, on an overview of, of the toolbox that gave us a, uh, an idea. Uh, the type of uh, fund vehicles available depends on the uh, investment strategies and, of course, the three eyes that Valentin, uh, you, you mentioned. And, and I just also wanted to remind everyone that uh, we, we will be hosting uh, another few series where we're going to be dive into some more details of the usage and also maybe the use of the AVE that uh, Stefan mentioned on a different type of available vehicles under the AVE. So um, just to, to let you guys know that there will be another more um, detailed chapter that coming up that you guys might be more interested. So, so I guess we, we have a brief idea of the type of fund regimes uh, in Luxembourg. And the next question would be, how can we set up a fund and, and what are the key factors that managers worth considering when, when, when they're setting up a fund? So maybe Valentin, you can share. I know you, you have some experience uh, from your side as a third party management company. Um, what, what typically the sponsor come to you uh, and what, they, what kind of question they ask? Yes, sure. Thank you, Connie. So it is true that when discussing the factors, fund initiators or manager need to consider when setting up a fund in Luxembourg, we often start by referring to branding, track record, local substance as key elements to run a successful fund project. Um, but from our experience at the third party independent management company in Luxembourg, we also see that stakeholders, setup and distribution plan are key. So at the structuring phase of a Luxembourg investment vehicle, being it UCITS or AIF, the understanding of the roles and responsibilities of all stakeholders is paramount. The choice of the service providers is an important step to tackle any administrative and also operational burden that may, but also will arise from the operation of the project. So having a look at this slide, we were willing to, to give you an overview of the various stakeholders that a fund initiator has to consider when um, forcing uh, the launch of a vehicle, an investment vehicle in Luxembourg. So while the investment decision and the asset raising efforts can be undertaken by the initiators, um, acting as fund manager and or distributor of the fund, daily management function, such as governance, risk management, evaluation, oversight, accounting, reporting, only to name a few, are to be undertaken by um, other providers and, and most of the time local. So which are those providers? Which are those stakeholders? Let's start with uh, the central administration um, at the center of the slide, central admin, which will usually the um, entity that will provide um, the fund with its domicile, the NAV calculation, 
and the transfer agency services to defend. So the services towards the um, investors. Um, next to it, um, you can see uh, the depository bank, depository, that is the entity that will take care of the safekeeping or ownership verification, depending on the asset class and monitoring of the assets. Um, you also have an audit firm which will be in charge of, for example, the semi-annual and or the annual audit um, of the fund. Obviously, a legal advisor, which will be in charge of the structuring tax aspect and overall legal advice to the fund, um, its initiators, but also um, the investors when we speak about limited partners. Um, and also um, an in-house, also called proprietary um, management company or a third party management company or IEFM, which will take care of the governance, the delegates of a site, the risk management, the valuation and, and the passporting. Um, at and least um, the investment manager, so often also the, the sponsor, the initiator of the fund, that can also from time to time act as distributor, referred in the slide um, as global distributor, two roles that are generally undertaken by the initiator of the fund. So this was to um, set the scene of the, the various stakeholders and uh, now happy to provide you also with additional details about a typical setup if we can go to next slide. So the aim of this slide was to um, refer again to the various stakeholders that we mentioned describing their responsibilities, but to help you to understand how they work together and um, how they are structured around the fund structure. So if we were to take the example of an alternative investment fund, being it a RIFE, a SLP, or a SIF, to see how those providers are coordinated and, and work with each other. At the center of the, the structure, you have the fund itself, being in a company or a corporate fund. The decision body of the fund, so its board of directors, will have to appoint the stakeholders, the service providers that we were referring to. Namely, as we said, a depository, an audit firm, a law firm, a central administration, and the AIFM to the fund. So this entity will be the ones taking care on site of the daily management of the fund, allowing the initiator to focus on its core activities, being alpha generation and investor relation. So if we were to start on the left-hand side of the slide, the fund, via its board of director, will have to appoint the distributor, the depository, the admin, the auditors, and to entrust them with the function we mentioned before via um, several agreements, which will be drafted and coordinated also thanks to um, the legal advisor that uh, the fund appoints. On the right-hand side of the slide, you can see that the fund will also have to appoint the AEFM. When we speak about ARRIVE, um, this will be, um, this will be uh, necessary, but when we speak um, of an SLP, like Stefan mentioned, it's an option. So um, the AEFM um, can be a proprietary entity established by the initiator or a third party entity. And the AEFM, so the Alternative Investment Fund Manager to the fund will be in charge of four core functions. Those functions are, as per the directive, the portfolio management, the risk management, the valuation, and the passporting. So from our perspective, the approach of our clients is to work with established and knowledgeable local business partners rather than setting up their proprietary AIFM. But um, as mentioned, our clients can um, act as the discretionary investment manager to the fund, provided that the entity is an asset manager supervised by a regulator 
which has conducting a MOU, so a memorandum of understanding with Luxembourg. And um, if this is the case, the portfolio management function, so the discretionary management of the underlying assets can be delegated by the IFM, subject to satisfactory due diligence to this entity. Um, what else can we say? Um, well, by using a local and established provider, it's obvious that initiators select a quick, cost-effective and compliant solution for their cross-border project. And by doing so, it's also true to mention that somehow they transfer the bulk of the administrative burden of the IFM directive compliance, such as the organization of a compliant portfolio, as we said, risk management, delegates oversight to a third party entity. So in other words, and maybe to conclude on, on this before to leave the floor to, to Stefan, this solution simplifies complexity and it helps initiators to realize their investment strategies and add true value to their investors. Well, thank you, Valentina. I think it's, it's a good transition to, uh, to, to say a few things, seeing this from, from Asia. Um, we, we see quite a, a very big majority of managers obviously using this AIFM of a third party provider model. So uh, almost none of them have set up their own AIFM somewhere in Europe or in Luxembourg in order to uh, be the AIFM of their own uh, funds. So they, they use that uh, possibility to use a third party AIFM for all the good reasons that you mentioned here. Uh, one thing that I would like to comment on the slide is that there are basically two models. The one you described, which is the AIFM delegates back the portfolio management to the manager itself here in Asia. And uh, you were mentioning MOUs uh, that are necessary in order to have the delegation model. And most countries in Asia have MOUs. China does not. It's uh, interesting to mention. But uh, most other countries do have MOUs with regards to AIFMD with uh, European regulators and the delegation uh, model works well. And if it doesn't, uh, one model which, which works well as well, and it's quite popular, is not to delegate the portfolio management, but appoint the entity in Asia as an advisor. And the AIFM then uh, is performing fully its function as alternative investment fund manager. It will make the decision based on the advice provided by the investment advisor. So that's that's another model that is uh, probably a bit less demanding uh, on the MOU side and on the license side for the, uh, for the advisor uh, compared to the delegated portfolio manager model. Two more things is that the structure that you have there on the slide, uh, we see it quite often, uh, not necessarily as a standalone structure. We see, for example, the very same structure often being set up as a European parallel vehicle to an existing Asian, US, uh, or Cayman structure. So you can see that this Cayman structure would be, you know, uh, dedicated to certain Asian investors, Japanese investors, for example, US investors, and then a manager would be setting up a fund following this typical fund structure for their European uh, investors. Both would be investing in an aggregator and that would be investing in to the target assets. So that's the parallel fund models we see this very same vehicle being set up for co-investment vehicle for carried investment vehicle needless to say we do have many applications for this kind of uh, of fund structures and as uh, valentine mentioned this fund that you see there as a triangle could uh, be an slp uh, could be a rave structure uh, and it would work in a very similar manner now what are the main drivers and i think that we touched on uh, most of them if we could go to the next slide we try to summarize them uh, a bit from experience. One is the very big reputation of Luxembourg, the very high standards of regulatory and compliance requirements that we uh, abide for in Luxembourg, mostly European driven uh, AIFMD usage rules, etc., are extremely uh, relevant. And the fact that we are a leader on the market uh, in Europe and, and worldwide for usage and non usage structure is clearly a very big advantage. The second, if we focus on um, AIFMD, but we could say the same for USITS, is it gives you a passport. And we'll speak about that with the marketing in just a second, but both AIFMD and USITS give you a slightly different, but, but in essence, uh, working similarly, 
uh, European distribution passport, whereby you can, by one single approval in one single jurisdiction, reach the entire European uh, Union. So that's, that's very important. Um, another aspect is the concentration of substance in one jurisdiction. And I, I, where I'm coming from is that one tax principle that is uh, around is the principal purpose test. And this idea that if you do have a vehicle somewhere uh, only to benefit from certain tax advantages or double tax treaties and things like that, well, if the only reason for which a vehicle is there uh, is that reason, that's, that's not enough. That's the principal purpose test. And that's, that's driven by the base erosion profit shifting rules that are sort of, and principles that are uh, um, accepted globally. The big advantage of having the fund, the GP, the AIFM, the administrator, the depository, the SPVs in Luxembourg is that you concentrate everything in Luxembourg in one given jurisdiction and that all pieces are interlinked and their only principle is obviously not to benefit from any uh, sort of uh, favorable tax treatment, it's just that the entire fund infrastructure uh, is consistently being designed in one jurisdiction as opposed to having the fund in one, the SPV in another, and the GP in a third jurisdiction. That's very important. And that is a very big driver for quite a number of our clients. Uh, tax neutrality is also important, uh, whereas we are not necessarily looking for tax optimization, we at least want to have uh, a tax neutrality, avoiding uh, tax leakage, which is achieved with this kind of vehicle, thanks to the double tax treaty network of Luxembourg, which is very broad, as well as the um, um, tax exemption uh, applicable to our vehicles, which uh, are obviously a must for a fund structure. I would add two more. Uh, one is the role of the AIFM. So what we are seeing in particular with, with Japanese institutional clients, but it, it goes beyond that, is that they very much uh, uh, like having a third party AIFM looking into what the manager has done and producing independent reports that the fund sponsor can then translate in Japanese, for example, and provide its investors. That's extremely valuable to them. And, and we see the role and, and the fees that are being paid to the AIFM very much uh, valued that way as well, on top of the compliance, the passport, and everything else that, that is provided by the AIFM. So that's, that's important. Another one is time to market. I must say that with our SLPs and the RAFE, uh, time to market is extremely efficient. So when we set up a RAFE structure, we can go as fast as three to four weeks. Um, what takes most of the time is actually the account opening uh, to, the, to do the KYC and the other aspects. And an SLP structure is just a matter of a couple of days uh, having the LPA drafted. So if the documentation is pretty simple and straightforward, that can go very, very fast. And one last aspect, which is often uh, brought up by clients, is in particular of those that are used to Cayman, and other offshore centers, which have to go through a certain you know, regulatory review in order to increase transparency, increase the substance which they need to have, is that if, if we do increase that, at least with a European structure and Luxembourg vehicle, they get the passport and they get the double tax treaties, which they cannot typically from an offshore jurisdiction. So that's, that's what we are hearing are being the main drivers uh, for our, our clients, uh, Connie. And I think that's really also uh, very helpful to, to knowing that to, to the number of drivers which kind of lead to some of the factors to consider when they're trying to set up the fund uh, on the rationale. And I know you, you have one point here on, on this slide. I, I also see a question that just came in, which is in relevant to the point that you brought up the, in this slide, which is a setup cost and maintenance cost. So maybe Stefan and also Valentin, you, you can mention, maybe just tell a little bit of the range of what's, what, what's going to be considered to be a, a, a more relevant cost for, for the manager to consider when, when, when they are setting up funds in Luxembourg. So a very, uh, very uh, straightforward answer to that. What we are seeing with most of the managers we're interacting with is at the end of the day, prices are pretty similar to what they are required to pay in, in the Cayman and in other places. Think about it this way. If you set up an SLP structure, you'll need to, to set up a GP that would be the same in an offshore center. You need to draft an LPA 
this document is roughly similar to what, what they do. In, so at the end of the day, it's the same amount of, of work, time and effort that needs to be put into the LPE and the offering memorandum. So at the end of the day, it's a little bit uh, more of a process because uh, uh, as we said, we are a high standard regulatory and compliance jurisdiction. And so we do need to go through all these checks but in terms of pricing, that's not going to be a, a material difference in any way. And the solution okay, was the cost. <laughs> and I'm sure uh, when we circulate both of your content, you'll be getting a lot of questions from, from the manager, exactly the type of structure they are, they, they, they're looking into and the relevant a solution that you will be able to offer. And thank you for that one. And I guess uh, last but not the least question, a lot of the managers are also very interested to know is, um, so they, they have, they know that the available funds that they can use and, and how to set up. And, and the next one will be, where, where can a Luxembourg fund be, be marketed? I'm happy to take it or uh, Valentin, if you want to, if you want to take that one. Go ahead. Okay. I follow. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> well, you know, I think that, that we, we, we cannot go through all the uh, questions regarding marketing. So we'll, we, when we prepare this, this first uh, chapter, we said we would focus on the, on the passport. Um, I think that you need to know that there are various ways to approach European investors, but um, if we need to look at an efficient way to approach investors in more than two, three jurisdictions, that's really one way, which is uh, the AIFMD passport for, um, for AIF products and, and obviously the USITS passport for uh, a liquid strategy and, and a USITS, a USITS product. Um, on top of Europe, where all those products can be sold to, uh, to investors based on these passports, they're also quite popular outside Europe. There's no restriction as to where a Luxembourg fund can be marketed. Outside the EU, you would not typically benefit from a passport, but you could benefit from either national private placement rules or um, uh, rules whereby you benefit from a fast track uh, approval process. And this is what we've done quite a bit. For example, with RAVE structure, if I need to speak about my experience in Asia, is that we've had them approved for institutional distribution in Korea, in Japan. We've had some being sold on, on a safe harbor basis in Hong Kong. Uh, Chinese investors have been invested in RAVES. Um, you know, uh, now with the QDLP coming uh, in, uh, in, in QFLP coming in China, there will be other opportunities for uh, money to be invested into Luxembourg RAVES structure. So really no restrictions as to where you can sell your product. Uh, outside the EU and within the EU, the big advantage is uh, benefiting from the European uh, passport, whether usage passport or AIFMD passport, Valentin. From what we see on the market, um, establishing a Luxembourg vehicle, uh, being it again a usage or an AIF, is um, within the EU block the most efficient solution if you were to compare that with uh, setting up several funds in each and every European jurisdiction, for example. Um, true to say that, as we already mentioned, um, Luxembourg is the go-to jurisdiction when it comes to distribution, given its status as the EU largest cross-border distribution center. But we also see an increasing interest from non-EU initiators due to, first, I would say, their willingness to attract um, European investors using, as we, as we said, uh, for example, parallel vehicle to their existing um, non-EU investment vehicle. And also to um, the investors' interest in allocating assets to new markets included, for example, something that we, we see nowadays, mainland China. So when we refer to, to marketing, um, the distribution plan is a key step in the success of a fund. That's always what we um, told our client. The distribution can either be done via the AAFM itself, the appointment of a placement agent, 
and the initiators um, can rely on the license of the AAFM, which will open, um, as Stefan mentioned, the relevant European jurisdiction. And um, something maybe that can also be used to wrap up on the marketing subject. We always um, recommend our client to gain local knowledge about the diverse distribution channels and also investors' behavior. Um, behavior which can very much vary between different jurisdictions, even in Europe. And it's always important to engage with um, local sales force when you are not used to the jurisdiction to obtain local market intelligence as marketing is, as you know, often the first line of investor interaction. So um, Luxembourg has welcomed over the last 25 years or even more, more than 50 or 60 um, countries manager that have decided to establish their international investment fund hub in Luxembourg. And uh, we can certainly say that we anticipate that Luxembourg will not only remain the gateway to Europe, but also to the rest of the world. Thank you, Valentin, and also Stefan for, for sharing all, all these uh, valuable um, thoughts on, on this one. And, and, and we, we do have quite a bit of questions came in and I guess we, we're also running out of time. So uh, we, we won't get a chance to uh, take it now, but we'll, we will take those questions offline and, and address them individually, um, given that we, we're running out of the time. But we appreciate you, you all being here. And thank you, Stefan, and also Valentin, and also everyone today for joining us. Um, we, we will be sharing our presentation um, after um, the session. And, and we look forward to seeing you all in our next series. As we mentioned, we will have a, a few more series coming in to, to dive into uh, details of each of uh, the available uh, vehicles. And, and thank you, you all, and have a good rest of the day.